Hello, and welcome to episode 22 of A Week in Watches, which is a weekly look back at the watch news and some of the stories from it. I'm your host, Zach Weiss, co-founder of Worn & Wound. Thank you for joining me. This was a good week for watches. There was actually a lot of cool stories, some pretty epic releases, and more importantly, lots of titanium, which if you know me really matters. Before we get into it, just one request. If you have any questions about the watch world and watch news, worn and wound, I don't know, anything watch related, put them in the comments below. Love to get some more questions going in a future episode. This week's sponsor is Watch Crunch, a dedicated social media site for watch enthusiasts. It's like a combination of a forum and Instagram but just about watches. You're gonna love it. Learn more about Watch Crunch later in this episode. Louis Arard gives us a Halloween treat. So Louis Arard is a Swiss brand that has uh, come back into prominence recently by doing some really cool collaborations with uh, various independent watchmakers and, and artists. Um, as well as uh, bringing some sort of like high-end craft into more affordable watch space. So they recently did a, a watch with Alain Silberstein, actually several watches. They did one uh, with Vianney Halter, which is quite surprising. They've also worked with, with our buddy uh, William Messina over at Messina Lab. Um, and in addition, they've worked with an artist, an interesting artist named Seconde Seconde. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm, I, I gotta learn how to pronounce these things before I get on the camera, but that's, a, that's another story. He's an artist who is sort of a horological vandal. So the, what he does is sort of takes watches and watch concepts and he'll change parts to, um, to give the watch a sort of like a visual sense of humor, a bit of a pun. He's worked with other brands before doing this, such as Nevada Grenchen, uh, Bamford, Moser, once again, Messina. Um, and he's actually also worked with Louis Arard before. And when he works with Louis Arard, they, they take this kind of funny approach and they play off the name Louis Arard. So the previous one wasn't called Louis Arard, it's called Louis Error. And that had this big blue bar going across the, the watch that said uh, basically error 404 on it. And that was actually the minute hand and it aligned with the 404 once in a while, like literally a, like a visual joke. And they're taking a similar approach to this Halloween edition, which is just very you know lighthearted and playful. So this time rather than Louis error, they went for Louis horror, horror. You get it. Anyway, so the brand which is known for regulators, typically, actually this time they went with their 39 millimeter small seconds model. So it just uh, has a small seconds dial on it, which is actually very big for the dial. It's like at the bottom half of the dial. It's quite cool looking. It's rendered in silver and white. Uh, it has a very clean look to it. But the logo, rather than saying, like I said, Louis Erard, says horror in like a bloody horror font, very similar to like what you'd see in like the Rocky Horror Picture Show title. And then instead of a seconds hand, there is a little ghost. Just a little ghost. It's there, he rotates around, I don't know, doing his ghosty thing. It's very novel, it's even quite silly. Uh, obviously it's not actually scary or anything. It's just a fun and playful, watch. Um, I, this is not going to be for everyone. I think a lot of people probably are, take this a little more seriously, but it, there's definitely people out there who will appreciate this sense of humor and to wear a watch that, you know, kind of has like a, a running joke on the seconds, if you will. There's only 178 units of this watch, so it's not a, a huge addition. They cost 1,975 Swiss francs, which is currently about the same in USD. Yeah, this is definitely going to be a for a self-selective crowd. Uh, for more on this, check out our post by Zach Kazan, which is on Worn and Wound, and we'll put a link somewhere for you to click. Rolex gets deep again. Uh, this is this is the controversial release of the week. Um, I'm not going to make a graphic for that. Hopefully, we don't have too many of those. But so Rolex uh, launched a new deep sea challenge watch, which is neat. I suppose it's definitely like a flex for the brand, brings them some attention. Obviously, anything Rolex does will cause quite a stir. It's sort of a stops the world of watches in its tracks and everyone will pay attention. And that's what happened this week with very little warning. I mean, we didn't know about it until it, until we saw it ourselves. But so this week they launched the new Deep Sea Challenge watch, which we'll get into, but they did it with a little twist. And it's actually really the twist that um, is a little bit more important than the watch itself. So what's a Deep Sea Challenge? It's a series of watches that were made to go to the deepest of depths, which is the Marianas Trench, which is 36,000 feet below. It's the deepest ocean trench on Earth. The concept of it, the deepest point in the ocean, is, is just absolutely terrifying in every way. I don't know, I, I might just be scared of, of deep water, but like the idea of whatever, it's terrifying. And in 1960, oceanographer Jacques Picard and U.S. Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh 
made that descent the first time in the Bathyscape Trieste. The submarine itself got to wear a very special watch for this expedition, which was called the Deep Sea Special. As watch nerds, you've probably seen photos of this around. It's this absolutely wild looking thing with this giant domed sapphire crystal, which is pure crystal. It's like yay tall. Basically, that's how, you know, part of the way they made it really water resistant is by making it huge and really, really thick, um, but still essentially a functioning watch, even if it was worn on the arm of a submarine and not on the arm of a person. In 2012, Rolex launched the Deep Sea Challenge alongside uh, famed film director James Cameron with his upcoming film Avatar 2. I'm sure you'll be hearing that name a lot in the near future. And he took a plunge into the trench himself. He's, a, he's an avid adventurist and a diver. For that, they built a modernized version of the Deep Sea Challenge, which looked essentially like an oversized uh, sea dweller. Still not meant for risks, but at the same time as launching that, they launched the Deep Sea Sea Dweller, which is that, um, Kind of the, the that Rolex watch with that blue to black dial that is very popular and was very popular and sort of commemorated that expedition as well but in a way that was more wearable that one was 44 millimeters in diameter with a 3900 meter water resistance so not ready to go down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench uh, but still pretty darn deep and it was certainly more wearable than the like monstrous one that was on the outside of the submarine so for the 10th anniversary of that last expedition they have launched a new quote unquote, wearable version of the deep sea challenge. It's a mere 50 millimeters in diameter and 23 millimeters thick. So I suppose that's a step down. There are, there are watches out there that are, are meant for wrists that are about that size. So it's within the realm of giant, ridiculous watches <laughs> as is. How is it really wearable? Well, here's where the twist comes in. This is the first production Rolex that is made of titanium. Woo, go titanium. Right, everyone? Go titanium. As Rolex is not known to make big changes or do much of anything new, um, this is actually like a really colossal moment in their history. Introducing a new material is just, you know, the kind of thing that everyone creates a fuss about with Rolex, even if titanium's been around uh, in watches for quite some time. As Blake Bettner pointed out in his uh, more informed introduction post on this, which I recommend reading if you want more details and kind of the, the Rolex uh, enthusiast's take on it, um, it is the first Rolex with a reference number ending in seven. So that last number is what indicates the material. So now we know seven indicates the use of titanium. It's quite a controversial release for many reasons. I mean, anything Rolex does is, um, you know, a brand that can't necessarily keep up with the demand for steel sports watches, making an oversized concept piece to launch a material rather than a more accessible watch, not that you'd be able to get it anyway, but it is likely an indicator that more in titanium uh, is to come from the crown because they're not just going to use it for one piece and then walk away. But uh, honestly, who knows though? Maybe they will. Don't take my word for any of it. <laughs> then again, if you've been waiting for a 50 millimeter, 11,000 meter diver in titanium, then like this is literally a dream come true because it's by Rolex. So that's pretty rad. And now a little bit about our sponsor, Watch Crunch. Are you looking for a place to share your thoughts on new watch releases? Do you want to talk about what watch you're lusting after? Are you tired of sifting through tons of posts on Instagram just to find good watch content because you're fighting against an algorithm? Me too, which is why I joined watchcrunch.com. It's a social media site built for watch enthusiasts from people just getting into the hobby to us salty seasoned collectors. It has all the features you're looking for, easy posting, tagging, commenting. It even has some photo editing and frankly other features like badges from wrist shots to reviews to polls to just straight up rants about watches. It makes talking watches with fellow watch enthusiasts simple, fun, and convenient. There's no barriers, no digging through sub forums, no ads, just watches. To get going, just head to watchcrunch.com in your browser. And once you're set up, give me a follow at at Zach Weiss, Z-A-C-H-W-E-I-S-S. -S. I'll see you and your watches there. Oxen Jr. makes my dreams come true. I don't need another watch. I don't need another watch. Repeat it after me. I don't need another watch. Oxen Jr. is a, a really like awesome and unique independent brand uh, founded by Ludwig Oxelin, who's this watchmaking wunderkind. We've actually mentioned him on episodes previously. He's known for many things, but he's the man behind the Ulysses Nardin Freak, which was uh, the first watch, I believe, to feature a silicon escapement. Um, the MIH chronograph, uh, many, many other things. The Oxen Jr. watches mix a, a cool and quirky minimal aesthetic with very cleverly conceived complications by Mr. Oxelin. 
uh, such as an amazing moon phase, a unique perpetual calendar. My personal favorite, the day night, which actually has these like baffles along the edge of the dial, which indicate the length of day and night in your position. Absolutely phenomenal watch. And Oxen Junior watches used to all be bespoke. You would uh, use their really, actually it's, it's a lot of fun. So they're, they're, they're customizer and you would basically pick the colors of every element on the watch. And it wasn't limited to just color. There was there were different materials there, gold foil, silver foil, really cool patinated surfaces. You get funky turquoises, dark, rusty browns, just really amazing looking stuff to make just incredibly gnarly looking, unexpected, still high-end though, like Swiss independent watches. For what they were, they were actually fairly reasonably priced, but they were also not inexpensive, obviously, for, for what you were getting. So they were the high, in the high four to low five figures, you know, with some of the more complicated watches, like the Perpetual Calendars, I think coming in around uh, 20. Okay, but you know, somewhere also around 8K. Last year, they introduced the Ox line, which is a more affordable version of uh, the Oxen Junior watch, but in a ready-made format. So no longer customizable, just set colors, you know, basically like any other watch brand out there. They used ETA 2824s as their base movements. Some of the more bespoke ones use a Lysine Nardin movement, which obviously just adds to the overall cost. So when they launched, they did so with some very simple models that were really more just a about the Oxen Junior aesthetic than the complication. So there was a straight up date model, which is a unique take on the date rather than showing a number through a single window. There is a dot that moves through a series of apertures on the dial. And then they have their dual time watch, which once again, doesn't have like a GMT hand or anything like that. It sort of has uh, what I would refer to as an internal bezel in some ways. There's a numeral track around the inside of the dial that you adjust to move where 12 and all the other numbers are, but it's manual. You just do that to be able to read time into time zone like a 12 hour bezel, but just all within the dial. So there was no none of their advanced comp applications until this week. So they just introduced the Anno 42, which is an annual calendar, which means that it only needs to be adjusted once a year on March 1st um, to account for, for February and leap years. Now this annual calendar model does and has existed in Oxen Junior for some time as one of their bespoke models, but it's really cool to see them bring it into this more affordable sort of entry point level model line. And it features one of Oxalin's complications, which this is part of what makes these watches so cool and so clever, is that in order to create this annual calendar, there is only an additional three parts needed to make it function, which is just completely crazy. It also is not really any different visually. It has a unique display, which features uh, three rings of dots. So there's the outer ring is the date, and that's what I mentioned before. It's the same as on their date model. And then there's two uh, smaller rings at like just below 12 and just above six. So the top ring represents the month, with January being in the top left, and then the dots moving counterclockwise. The bottom ring is then the day, with, uh, which rotates clockwise and has Sunday as the top dot. There is no numeral anywhere on this dial. There's no words, there's nothing indicating what these are. You kind of have to learn it and then get used to reading it. It's certainly a, a more abstract, minimal approach, but it's part of the Oxen Junior aesthetic kind of take it or leave it. So the Anno 42 is called 42 because it's a 42 millimeter watch uh, with 100 meter water resistance, which I was just pleasantly surprised to see. And it is made out of grade five titanium. Go titanium. Um, it's basically a lugless watch, so it would wear smaller than 42 millimeters uh, would typically sound. Um, that said, they commonly make their watches in 42 and 39. So I am unsure if the 39 is gonna come out later. The fact that they named it Anno 42 sort of suggests that maybe there will be another model, but don't take my word for it. There's three colors of this at launch, black and white, blue and orange, and my favorite, which is blue and brass, which just looks really charming. These watches, if you are in the US, come in at 5,077 Swiss francs, which is around 5K. So just to put that into perspective, you know, that's a $5,000 annual calendar made by a Swiss independent brand helmed by one of the great, you know, modern watchmakers. So it's a pretty cool value and definitely a great way into the world of Swiss independent watchmaking. And now it's time for the release of the week. Christopher Ward chimes in a new era for the brand. Christopher Ward, the little British brand that could. They released quite an epic watch this week 
that was all about bringing hot horology to the masses. It's called the C1 Bel Canto. I already wrote and actually we filmed a whole intro for that watch already, which aired on the day it launched. So go check that out for uh, more of an in-depth, uh, hands-on look at the watch. Today is more of a TLDR um, with some new elements to the story that I actually didn't know when I wrote that and we filmed that. But in case you did not see that, here we go. The C1 Bel Canto is not your ordinary launch for Christopher Ward or anyone else for that matter. It's a sonnerie, it's a chiming watch, um, but made affordable, yet still quite exotic and luxurious. Watches like Minute Repeaters or Omega's new Chrono Chime um, easily get into six-figure territory. It's one of the most coveted complications um, it's something that has been really limited to just the very high end. Now, to be clear, Christopher Ward did not make a minute repeater, uh, perhaps someday, who knows. Uh, rather, they made a watch that chimes at the top of the hour, which uh, is called a sonnerie au passage. It marks the passage of time. How'd they do it? Well, they had in their complication arsenal, which is something not many brands have, a jump hour module called the JJ01. Their current technical director, Frank Stelzer, at some point realized that he could turn that into an hourly chime with some fairly heavy modification. The first version of this was actually seen in the Meister Singer Bell Aura, which came out last year, which was also very cool. But for the C1 Bel Canto, uh, they went the extra mile by bringing the whole complication dial side. So it has exposed gongs, uh, hammers, and, and other workings as well. Additionally, it has a decentralized hour and minute dial. There's something about a, a decentralized hour and minute sub dial that I think gives the watch a really modern, exotic, and, and kind of indie style to it, sort of, you know, in the vein of some of these really high-end brands like MB&F, Arm & Strom, Moser, and actually a bit of Grand Seiko too. I, I couldn't help but notice that the Grand Seiko Koto Constant Force Tourbillon actually had a sort of a similar style to it. And once again, that's a, a six-figure watch. What I learned after release is that they had some really impressive partners in making this watch too, which actually includes Arm & Strom. So they made the blue platine dial surface that you see on the front of the watch underneath uh, all those floating elements, which has a beautiful sunburst effect that actually comes out of the center of that sundial. Then the bridges, gongs, and hammers were made by Chronode, which is a high-end movement specialist that also does work for MBNF, Hermes, Chapek and C, and many others. So this is a really, really high-end watch making stuff. So in order to pull this off, the brand created the new caliber called the FS for Frank Stelzer. Zero 01. It's a module on a Solita SW200 that required over 50 new components. It took several years to get it right, included uh, R&D for all the elements, including testing over 80 gong shapes. They had to play with all the different elements as well to maximize the volume and the tonality of the chime itself, which um, is apparently a D note. And then it also includes the case, which is a 41 millimeter, and have you guessed it yet? Grade five titanium case. Well, go titanium. So uh, titanium apparently, uh, given its natural properties, is better for acoustics than steel. Now you might be saying 41 millimeters, that sounds a bit large, but having worn this, I have to say the complexity of the dial sort of demands a little bit more real estate. So it makes sense on the wrist. But what's the real kicker? The watch cost $3,600. That's $3,600 for a Swiss made chiming watch. That's not cheap but it's uh, groundbreaking for what it is, and it is certainly a very, very fair price when you look at it across the industry. It's a really breathtaking achievement for the brand. I'm very excited for them, and it seems that everyone else was too. People really recognized uh, the significance of this watch, and all 300 sold out fast, like in a few hours. So sadly, with a week in watches being on Sunday, we were a little late for this watch uh, at, at launch. There's perhaps a silver lining, which is that Christopher Ward has added a waitlist form on their loop site, which we can link to. So perhaps they're considering another Bel Canto in the future. I honestly don't know, but it is cool and interesting that they put a waitlist there. And that is it for A Week in Watches, episode 22. Once again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Watch Crunch. Don't forget to head to watchcrunch.com. Also, head to warnandwound.com to stay up to date to new releases on the day that they come out, in case you don't want to miss a limited edition. Please do give us a like and subscribe to this video or a rating on podcasts or wherever it is you have found this content. We really appreciate it, and uh, thank you. I'll see you next time.